Hey everybody, your favorite professor here. Uh, <laughs> sorry, being awkward, but we are, so this is the first of the multiple online videos that we're gonna make. And what you're gonna have is you're gonna watch these videos and I'm gonna be pretty super awkward in it because I'm used to in-person, but as I switch and get better at the, these online presentations, you're, it's gonna be interactive. And you'll see a lot of the, the questions that you need to answer on Canvas. So to make this work and you're going to hopefully see some really cool innovative stuff in terms of these new online formats. Today we're going to talk about the social and economic outlook for an aging society. And as you see here in this picture, the, this is my local Vons. And this local Vons has special, actually, times for older adults to come to the supermarket. And we talked about that, and we all know what's going on right now with the coronavirus. And first, there's a lot of irrational behavior going on. You see all these shelves getting unstocked, especially with breads, toilet paper, it's a toilet paper apocalypse. So for older adults, they are more susceptible to being at risk when they are out in public. So hence why these companies like Vons and Whole Foods have shifted, made the special time in the morning for just older adults to go to. And what we're going to go overview today is pretty much a lot of overview the the social and economic outlooks and just the experiences of aging in this society specifically we're going to talk about more of the practices the policies and the, just the the social conditions related to the aging experience talk about we talk about SES first and how that relates to the diverse experience of aging then we talk about technology and medical interventions that are coming through. We talk a little bit about ageism, and then we will discuss just general policies related to supporting the aging population, along with adaption and resilience. So as we talked about a couple classes ago about what is the major killer of older adults, and you see this here, that the majority of the causes of death for aging adults, two thirds, is chronic diseases. And those who have chronic diseases are more susceptible to this coronavirus that's going on right now. He says older adults and people with chronic medical conditions are most at risk for the coronavirus. We've got our Dr. Tara Narula here to explain what precautions to take if you or your loved ones are vulnerable. So we keep talking about people who are vulnerable. What does that mean in practice? What conditions are most uh, susceptible to the virus? Right, so on the CDC call yesterday that they gave as a briefing, they mentioned these conditions, cardiovascular disease, including things like hypertension, diabetes, if you have chronic lung disease, but also if you're immunosuppressed, you have cancer, or some, you're on some medication that is weakening your immune system. These are some of the conditions that we're talking about. We're, 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 we're familiar with talking about things that affect the young and the old, and usually those populations are both vulnerable, but right. now we have the old vulnerable but children right. apparently not why it's so interesting so you're right you usually see a u-shaped curve where at the tips of your u the kids and the elderly you're most vulnerable with COVID-19 we're really seeing kids being spared from severe disease and the elderly being affected when we talk about ages we're talking about individuals over 60 but with risk really increasing the older you get over 80 being at the highest risk why might this be? Well, when you look at the elderly, they tend to have weaker immune systems. They also have more of these chronic health conditions. And what we think is that their immune system reaction to the virus may be kind of dysregulated, overwhelming. So they develop what we call cytokine storm. You release all these inflammatory mediators that then damage the lungs. When you look at the kids, on the other hand, what's kind of reassuring for parents is, at least in China, the 70,000 cases they looked at, less than 2% were in those individuals under the age of 19. No children died in South Korea or no anybody under 30. There were no deaths and no deaths under the age of nine in China. 
again, how does this happening? You know, kids may have, for some reason, the virus may not replicate as easily. They may have less mature receptors in the lungs, we call the ACE receptors, where the virus latches onto. Mm -hmm. And another theory is that as kids, you're exposed to all these other coronaviruses, not COVID-19. Yeah. Maybe right. you're developing yeah. antibodies that are cross-reactive. All right, are pregnant women more vulnerable in this? Another thing that a lot of women want to know. So we don't have a lot of data on this, so it's a data-free area. What is the effect on pregnant women, on the fetus, on the infant? What we know is that during pregnancy, your immune system sort of down-regulates so that you don't reject the baby. Um, and also your physiology changes. And this can set you up for being more vulnerable to respiratory viruses. When you look at SARS and MERS, we did see some cases where there was pregnancy loss or miscarriage. Um, so far, in a limited case series in China, we have not seen transmission from mother to baby in the newborns that were looked at, and no evidence of virus in the amniotic fluid or breast milk. What about smoking and vaping? Yes. How, how does that impact? Well, if there was ever a reason to quit, here's another one. <laughs> right. um, anything that's going to compromise your lungs is going to increase your risk of being susceptible. We know that smoking in decreases your ability to really fight infection. And one other interesting thing is that in China, we see more men dying from COVID-19 than women. And one of the theories is that 50% of men in China smoke, less than 2% of women smoke. So this wow. smoking that, that have a fact right stunned, yeah. I have yes. to say, yeah. Yes. So. so the CDC is now uh, actively saying avoid cruises if you're in this vulnerable population. Are there other precautions that you could say would be wise? Right, so you saw Stephen Colbert, right? Yes, right. Avoid, avoid social Crowds. gatherings. Yeah, so for vulnerable populations, you really do want to try to stay home. Avoid situations where you're going to be in close contact with other people, where there's a lack of real great ventilation, uh, where you're going to be exposed to the droplets. Um, and even non-essential long plane flights, you want to avoid. Stock up on important medications, whether it's blood pressure medicine, diabetes meds, fever or pain meds that you might need, supplies, uh, avoid high-touch surfaces, so handles, elevator buttons, anything where you could get exposed. And then this is really important, is to make a plan with your caregiver. What's going to happen? Who's going to take care of me? What if my caregiver gets sick? And then also, people don't like to discuss what they might want to happen in the event that they do decompensate. Do I want a breathing tube put in? Oh, what yeah. is my end of life care mm. look like? Right. And that these are hard discussions, but important discussions to have. Oh, some tough decisions. Hopefully people will begin to think about them yeah. and talk about yes. them. Thank you, Dr. Tara Nalula. So they highlight a lot of what we talk about in this class about what, who is most susceptible to these diseases and why older adults are more susceptible, as you saw. And here is a neat little graph from Johns Hopkins that populates every day on the, the, the new cases of COVID-19. And I, sh I shared the link there. It's just so if anybody is interested. And so just to, just to show this as a whole, we talk about the, the lifespan, right? We're really gonna talk about today and focus on these macro level policies and also all these things that, all these factors that affect the aging process. So me being from New York, you know, I was one of those people in there. Uh, there are so many different paths and trajectories to take. And when my dad retired in 2010, he actually started working at a, a market, do, do, becoming a butcher. Uh, we used to have a restaurant prior to that. So that was a kind of like an encore career or what we call a, a bridge employment before he fully retired. He was about in his uh, mid 50s. And but another person that I know that retired at the same time as my dad, he actually didn't have British employment. And we'll talk a little bit about what it means to not be employed or have lack of employment in your 50s, being fired when you're 50s. And he always went to the bar and also played golf. So so we're going to talk about but he was a little he had a little more different situation based on his developmental trajectory. So when we talk about the diversity of the aging experience, 
we first we talk about social economic status, right? SES. And a lot of this has to deal with your social class and uh, whether you're rich or you're poor. And this is made up of three factors. Your, your income, how much you make, your, your education, and the type of job you have, the, your job prestige. And all of this factors in and interplays with each other to, to, to formulate how much influence and choices and power you have during the, the aging during the aging process, right? And we see a backlash here with uh, if those that you rem those who would remember the the Occupy Wall Street with a one percent owning so much. So these different trajectories. So first thing is we'll talk about is education, and you could see here that education really matters you are less likely to be unemployed if you have a bachelor's compared to a, a just high school. And also you're projected to make two times as much. Now, it really matters. Education really matters it, statistically. And education also affords people to go into more what we call white collar jobs as opposed to blue collar jobs. When we talk about white or blue collar, it involves manual labor, which is blue collar traditionally, and white collar, which is more uh, uh, desk jobs or, or, or more jobs that don't involve manual labor. So there is a big difference when we talk in the aging process between between those who have worked predominantly a, a blue collar job versus a, a white collar job. Those who work more blue collar jobs down the line as they age because they're taking a more, a bigger toll on their body, let's just say construction workers, down the line, they uh, experience more adverse health effects compared to those who are white collar. And those you could also see down here that those who are more educated, well, I guess this goes back to those who are more educated just make uh, a lot more money over a course of time. Beyond money, more education also affords you more choices in jobs and the less likelihood to get automated, at which this clip in John Oliver explains. And when automation does lead to job loss in certain sectors, historically, it's also actually created jobs, as this economist from MIT explains. Let's do the following thought exercise. It's the year 1900, and 40% of all employment is in agriculture, right? And so some torpy economist from MIT teleports back in time and says, 100 years from now, only 2% of people will be working in agriculture. What do you think the other 38% of people are going to do? Well, I wouldn't know. We, we say, oh, search engine optimization, <laughs> you know, uh, health and wellness, software and mobile devices. Most of what we do barely existed. Exactly. That twerpy economist is right. <laughs> 50 years from now, people will be doing jobs that we can't imagine right now, like crypto baker or snail rehydrator or investment harpist. I don't know. The point is you can't imagine them. So, so we get rid of some jobs, but we get new ones. So that's even Stephen, right? Well, not necessarily, because the new jobs automation creates won't necessarily pay the same as the ones it takes away. And it might not be easy for displaced workers to transition into them. For instance, right now, our economy is creating lots of jobs in the tech sector. At the same time, we have three and a half million truckers possibly facing unemployment due to driverless technology. Now, in an ideal world, those truckers could seamlessly move into high-tech jobs. But as this man explains, it's just not that easy. If the average age is 55, what, are these guys going to be computer programmers? But they didn't finish high school? I doubt it. Of course. I mean, but maybe some 55-year-old truck drivers will become web designers. But if you think all of them will. It might be worth remembering that time your father accidentally typed his Google search into Facebook and then tried to cover it up by putting whiteout on the computer. So, so the big question here is, 
How do you harness what is good about automation while minimizing the damage to those hurt by it? Get ready for some more awkwardness. But when we talk about jobs, right? People are going to be working longer than ever because of a lot of these medical innovations. And we're just going to be talking about a couple of the cutting edge things that are going on right now. Sorry, I'm dubbing myself again <laughs> because of the, the audio. But just wanted to just highlight a couple of really interesting ones that you might be seeing. But they also relate to social economic status. Those who are able to, they, they could keep their health, right? Usually have the most money to do that. You know, they can engage in these, a lot of these innovative therapies, right? That they could spend money on. And you see that, that perpetuates a cycle. They're able to live longer, work longer, and be able to have, a, all of these advantages, right? And this, these advantages add up, especially as you age, especially when you could spend so much money on it. You know, it's like the, the fountain of youth, you're throwing money at gaining the fountain of youth to keep yourself young. And there is a, a, there's a lot of medical innovations going on, especially involving uh, that really relate to some research done in animal models, but a lot of these animal model, uh, the, these animal model uh, interventions are really new. So, for example, there's this one about sharing blood. You know how Dracula wants to suck people's blood to stay alive. It's it's really interesting because. There is actually some semblance of like reality relating to sucking somebody's blood, right? To feel younger. And a lot of this research relates to something called parabiosis. Essentially, these are attaching two animals together. And when they, sh one young and one old, and when they share blood, really interesting things start to happen. The, essentially, the younger one gets to get gets older in the sense of their behaviors, and the the and the older one gets younger. You know, more sprite, more energetic, and it, it's really interesting. They they sh they so they you can see a picture over here. They essentially they fuse them together so they share a bloodstream. Yes, this is true. <laughs> so they share a bloodstream. So the young and the old mouse are bind together, and you start to see the young mouse become older, and the <laughs> and the older mouse become younger. There's something about the the younger blood or the older blood. Something in the blood is related to whether uh, how how old they act and how old they are it's super interesting stuff and i and there these this is even though this has been shown to have some effect this in animal models people are actually especially those who are in the higher social economic status are actually engaging in some of these therapies it's pretty interesting and we don't really know what's really going on, but we think it's something with when you're younger, your blood is more efficient, right? Think about your cells, right? They're able to, they have less error. They're able to efficiently work compared to older, right? Senescent cells, those are the ones that are, are dying uh, toward the end of life and less efficient in carrying out energy expenditure. And this this is really interesting and this is a this is a little clip joking about it from a silicon valley people won't want to participate until the quality is high and the quality won't be high until um and uh, the quality won't be high until we have a lot of people opt into the network so that presents a little bit of a a, a, a unique continue uh, uh okay it presents a, a, a bit of a problem What would that we kind of need to build. Uh, uh, 
Oh, sure. Everything okay? I, I don't know. Is it? Oh, sorry. Guys. Bryce. Bryce. Guys. Uh, actually, we've met. Oh. Hey, Donald. Uh, it's Jared now. So, Gavin, Bryce is... Very discreet. Keep going. This is great. Uh, is Bryce your assistant? No, of course not. He's my transfusion associate. Which is? Are you really not familiar with parabiosis? Can't say that I am. Well, the science is actually pretty fascinating. Regular transfusions of the blood of a younger, physically fit donor can significantly retard the aging process. And Bryce is a picture of health. Just look at him. He looks like a Nazi propaganda poster. Oh. That is just a little uh, clip of it, but this is in jest. Obviously, this is a TV show, but that, that just show you could think about it, though. Those who have access, that have money, that have the resources to engage in these therapies are able to, to, to have them. And those who do not are, are not, will, will not. And that just just shows that there's just so much diversity in aging, you know, the, the Aging is such a, uh, it, it, it really just it doesn't matter what at that time, it, it really deals with like what has happened to you and what your characteristics are earlier in the lifespan. And one big thing, and we talk about now in society, just think about the differences between gender, gender and pay, right? And we see here that women right they make less they make about 20 percent less than men in those of the same uh, position and just think about the compounding effects of that right when you make 20 percent less it's not just a one period in time that's just over a lifetime and then that real that compounds to to affect aging and possibilities right and when we talk about also the, the minority experiences, right? There's just historical policies and human disadvantages that have come into play, especially with race and gender. And we just even see here, you, you could just see the, the effects of either having a job or, or making less money early in the lifespan leading to other aspects relating to aging. Just that when you're set to retire, you'll make a lot less. You'll have less to retire compared to somebody who, who, who is predominantly just uh, a white male. And in general, this the minority population is also changing. Right? There are going to be more and more people who are, who are aging and it, who are minorities. And you can see here with this, with this graph of the population. Okay, so as you see here, there's also the aging population is also really changing, right? Those, it, it will get more and more diverse as time progresses. That's also another factor in aging and we can't talk about how society is changing because the population is changing because the baby boomer generation is 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 becoming older and older and being more starting to transition into retirement there's this ageism right this ageism is this pretty much is this discrimination based on somebody's age and even though there are laws such as the Aging Discrimination Act of 1975, though uh, people who they're, they're just it's rampant uh, ageism, and it's not necessarily overt. It's more of these subtle. But there are certain industries such as being a pilot that that retirement mandatory retirement is required. So uh, for pilots, it's 65 years old, right? And it's still about, uh, that still holds today. But you'll, you see this, the more subtle part of uh, ageism is when they start pushing out uh, older adults and 
and or or treating them differently because of that. And it's not necessarily it's not necessarily a a, a malicious thing because we do know just biologically that the fluid what well, we talked about the fluid and uh, the fluid intelligence right they just their cognitive processing is just slower than somebody who is younger right? and that starts to decline in their 50s so there's this great like debate about how what, what do we do right how we want to protect older adults right and but and keep have them keep jobs but then also what about performance Right, they're they're going to adapt slower and learn slower, right? As we learned in the fluid intelligence, so this is just a, another one of those debates that society has, right? Do and it's really prominent because it also taxes the legal system because about twenty percent of cases, right, really have to do with. Uh, equal employment, uh, especially these ageism uh, uh, cases relate to uh, a discrimination based on age. And the, this discrimination based on age really has detrimental effects. When we talk about detrimental effects, we, we start to see that people who are let go when they're in their 50s are the experience the worst health outcomes right they're no longer this bright per, bright future person that that somebody could go up the ranks but then they they also need to pay them a lot more in their 50s so they're in this in between spot it's for them to it'll be difficult for them to find employment so this is why when people when we see here that this article highlights about recession and older workers this is really detrimental to their health because those are the ones who are usually making the most money but then also one of the people who get uh let go first and when we we talked about this and we saw this a lot also in the Great Recession, which started in 2008. There, there, there was just this whole horde of people getting let go from the work and the older adults, that, that was one of the first uh, cohorts to get let go. As you see here, they're, they're just the very nature of retirement is changing. And as you can see here, it's becoming taking longer and longer to quote unquote officially retire through the government standards and by the time that you retire we we don't know how long it's going to be right and just think about it so it's kind of to wrap it up due to these like these increase in medical innovations right that increases one lifespan increases in these public health right especially for those who are of the higher SES, right? We don't know what's going to come in the future, right? So this is all very fluid, right? We see here that it's, that it's 67 now currently, but we have no idea what it's going to be. This is going to be ever evolving situation. And we see here that, that the life expectancy is going up and up and up. So we don't know. Remember we talked about lifespan, right? That's going, that hits around 120 right now. It's not implausible, especially with all of this, uh, all these medical interventions being explored that, who knows, it might be 150, right? You might have uh, <laughs> transfusion associates, right? So, we have to move these policies in general to to reflect the, this this longer sense, uh, this long, longer lifespan and life expectancy. Right there is this what we call structural lag, right? Because these medical interventions are innovating more and 
faster and faster. And there's reform to social security, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the next coming classes, because there is because of the taxing of the system, because people are living longer and longer. So what I want you to do for class is just to reflect on this scenario, right? And you're going to upload it onto Canvas, and I'll provide the instructions. But you are Franco, a 61-year-old construction worker. For over 35 years, you have been in the construction industry. So I'm going to have you upload what your take on this scenario would be. And you're going to upload it onto Canvas, and I'll provide the, the, the instructions of the of uh, just put yourself in Franco's shoes in this situation and you're going to provide your opinions. And then you're going to also put yourself in Laura's situation and also provide your opinions onto Canvas and I'll describe how you could do that in there. So I just don't want to say that society is changing for all bad because just even within the recession, there, it was a mixed blessing for many right many just think about the recession in 2008 was a way out for people right because usually when uh, you let somebody go who has been there has a long tenure there they have they usually require uh, a severance right a severance is pretty much a, a lump sum of money to to say okay uh we we're gonna separate so right? it's almost like a baby divorce if you could think about it like that and this so a lot of people were able to have a, a severance, right? A, from and then separation support from being in a dissatisfied job, so they could create their new trajectories. And during this heart of recession is when I used to, so my like I said before, my family had a Chinese restaurant, and I used to my whole job there essentially was to pack the orders and everything, but also make conversation with the customers. And many of them were, were on en route to these all new exciting trajectories. They were studying to be nurses and teachers, more of these generative uh, occupations, which they weren't doing before. So it, they were able to adapt and, and they, they sought new opportunities, right? Even though they were 50 plus, 60 plus, this was something that was really novel to them and they, they essentially gave them new life right and there was this there were the never for them this was like a, a reboot so we talked about more of this so this macro system these these levels revolving around aging in society and how all, so many of these factors affect how people age and the diversity of trajectories that happen that happen when they age so going back to the coronavirus we the, one of the best things i've seen about that and also to protect not even just yourself but all of those around you is to engage in these public health behaviors such as washing your hands and so i love this uh, this video from Vietnam that started this whole TikTok viral sensation. This catchy dance about preventive measures against the coronavirus is spreading, hopefully, faster than the virus itself. A Vietnamese dancer coordinated the moves to go with the song released by Vietnam's Institute of Occupation and Environmental Health. The public service announcement urges people to wash hands and rub, rub, rub evenly. Do not touch eyes, nose, and mouth, and limit visits to crowded places to push the virus away. The rendition dubbed Gen V, which is Vietnamese for coronavirus, is sparking a new TikTok dance challenge with the hashtag GenCoV Challenge. John Oliver compared it to the next best thing since the rubber ducky song on Sesame Street. The song's incredible. It makes all other songs about washing yourself look like trash. And I'm, I'm talking to you here, Ernie. And while other artists were out there, out there innovating, you kept singing the same old ducky song. You lost the hunger, son. <laughs> 
dancers are asking people participating to perform the six hand-washing movements, share and tag two friends. The choreographer cited research from MIT that 78% of people say they wash their hands often, but only 25% actually do it after using the bathroom. And only 20% do it before cooking. Simple steps to contain the virus and make it so people find it hard to forget to wash their hands. For InsideEdition.com, I'm Lisa Wojcicki. So you can see that uh, I'm a big fan of John Oliver as well, but that's just a nice creative way to keep not only yourself safe, but your old, your loved ones as well, especially those who are older. And this song is actually amazing. If those who haven't heard it, I'm just gonna play a little clip of it, but it is amazing. And I've played it on loop at my house personally. song is fire right it is fire that song so so thank you for dealing with this first video of uh, this is we're working out the the kinks for the, for all of this you know but just to remind you just to be safe out there and as always de nada. i'll see you next time